After watching this video lecture, students will be able to differentiate between saturated, unsaturated, and supersaturated solutions, um, explaining how solutions are formed, as well as um, the availability of solutions uh, with respect to various phases of matter. Um, students will also be able to explain the driving forces behind solution creation, um, including the enthalpic and entropic values. A solution is a mixture that consists of two or more substances and is homogeneous in terms of characteristics. Um, so basically, uh, you have multiple parts to a solution. Uh, one part is going to be the solute, okay? And solutes um, are the things that are dissolved into um, the solution and it is usually present in a smaller quantity than the other component of a solution, which is known as the solvent, okay? And that's the thing that actually does the dissolving. Um, and it's present in larger quantities. So solutions can be any combination of solute and solvent. You can have gas-gas mixtures, you can have gas-liquid, um, and so on and so forth. So uh, homogeneous solutions um, are basically just mixtures of two or more substances. So solutions are going to be described in three ways. They're either going to be saturated, um, unsaturated, or supersaturated. So a saturated solution um, is going to be a solution that contains the maximum amount of solute um, dissolved in a specific quantity um, of solvent at a specific temperature. Um, an unsaturated solution is going to be one that contains less solute um, then that specific quantity of solvent at that specific temperature has the capacity to dissolve. Um, so basically, in an unsaturated solution, you're going to be able to continue to add solute, and it will continue to dissolve until it reaches the point of saturation. Now, a supersaturated solution is going to be created um, when you've basically added more solute than is possible um, to be dissolved in the saturated solution uh, volume of solvent. Now, what ends up happening in supersaturated solutions is that in order to create them, we usually have to add um, heat. Okay, so by adding uh, heat, we increase the temperature of the uh, solvent, and the solvent is therefore going to be able to dissolve more of that particular solute. So, when making solutions, there are two factors that we need to consider. Okay, so the first thing we have to consider is the natural tendency of the substances um, in the mixture to actually combine and, and want to interact with one another. So basically, the te natural tendency of the solute and the solvent to mix. The second thing to consider is the type of intermolecular interactions um, that are actually involved in the solution process. So mixing is a spontaneous process, uh, meaning that it doesn't require any energy input. Um, and we understand this in the context of gases. Um, when we separate uh, two gases and then remove that barrier that's separating the two gases, the gases will diffuse past one another and basically distribute um, evenly throughout that container and basically uh, mix with one another. Um, now, a concept or an idea that we're going to have to consider in the mixing processes is a thermodynamic quantity known as entropy. And we're going to talk about entropy in more um, detail later. But what we need to come away with with respect to entropy is that um, it is a measure of the disorder associated with the process. And it's actually a driving force for many processes in chemistry. Okay, so um, the entropy is going to determine the mixing or the spreading um, of the substances within a mixture. Um, so when substances mix, the uh, randomness or the disorder that's created um, is associated with that entropy increase. And, and as I said, we'll talk about that in more detail later. Um, but some things we also need to consider with respect to the mixing process that's occurring in um, solutions is that it's going to be very different or, or different from our gas mixtures. Um, and the reason why is because in gas mixtures we're assuming um, our gases are behaving ideally um, and that they do not have um, intermolecular forces um, causing interactions between the molecules. Okay, And so with that assumption, um, that's not even a consideration during the uh, mixing procedures. However, for solutions, we do have to take that into consideration because there will be intermolecular forces between the solvent and the solute 
um, as well as the solute and the solute and the solvent and the solvent. And we'll discuss this in detail in a second. So we need to talk about the types of intermolecular um, interactions that are going to be present uh, when creating or forming a solution. Okay, so the first thing that needs to be considered is the solute-solute interaction. So the solute-solute interaction is going to be an intermolecular force um, set that are going to have to be overcome in order for solutions to be produced. Um, in that same vein, the solvent-solvent interactions, the intermolecular forces between the solvent um, molecules, also have to be overcome. Okay, And then eventually we'll get to the point where we have um, solvent-solute interactions and we've actually created a solution. Now, the extent um, to which dissolving is going to occur or can occur is going to be dictated by the relative magnitudes of the enthalpy values for the breaking apart of our solute-solute and solvent-solvent um, uh, intermolecular forces, and um, obviously the enthalpy associated with the solvent-solute interactions. So the energy associated with uh, making solutions is going to be referred to as um, the enthalpy or heat of solution. Okay, and basically this is the energy change for the, this process. Okay, and it's going to be most easily understood or monitored if we break the um, solution production um, into individual steps. Okay, so the first step we're going to look at is the breaking apart of our solvent, solvent intermolecular forces. Okay, so once we break those apart, then we're going to talk about or look at um, the energy associated with breaking apart the solute-solute interactions, and then, of course, um, the uh, interactions between the solute and the solvent um, are going to be the last intermolecular forces that we will consider um, when looking at our overall enthalpy of solution. So we know from Hess's law that the individual steps um, or individual steps that are associated with reaction can be summed together to find um, the enthalpy of an overall process. So our delta H of our solution can be calculated by figuring out the delta H of our solute-solute interactions um, and how to overcome those. Same thing with the solvent-solvent um, interactions and then of course our solute-solvent interactions in the mixing process. Okay, so um, in the first portion, uh, we're going to look at the breaking apart of the solvent. So in the case of breaking apart your solvent, say H2O, we're overcoming uh, the H bonds that form between water molecules. Okay, so in that sense, since we're overcoming those attractive forces, energy has to be put in. Okay, and because of that, um, our delta H of our solvent, um, solvent interactions are going to be positive. Okay, the same is going to be held true when we break apart the solute-solute interactions because, once again, we have to overcome the attractive forces between those molecules. Okay, so we know that um, the solvent-solvent and solute-solute interactions are going to require energy and have positive delta H values um, associated with them. So when it comes to the third part, um, when we start talking about the mixing of the solute and the solvent particles, what we're actually looking at is the formation of intermolecular forces between your solute and your solvent. Now, depending on the characteristics of the solute and the solvent, um, that's going to dictate whether this delta H of mixture value is positive or negative. So in the cases where the solute and the solvent have similar polarities in terms of the molecules, uh, they're going to end up with similar uh, intermolecular forces, okay? And similar intermolecular forces are going to lead to interactions forming between the solute and the solvent, um, and that's going to lead to a um, negative delta H of mixture value, okay? Now, in the case uh, where we have unlike polarities associated with the molecules, we're going to end up with... Um, interactions that don't actually want to form. So what ends up happening is our delta H of our mixture um, is going to end up usually being positive um, and basically what that means is that our delta H of our solution um, is going to end up being positive as well. And why is that? Okay, well we know our delta H of solute and our delta H of solvent, um, those two values are going to be positive because we have to put energy into um, make them up. 
or, or to break them up, excuse me. Um, in the case of delta H of the mixture, we're hoping that the um, interactions between the solute and the solvent will be favorable, um, and basically that intermolecular force formation between the molecules will lead to um, an enthalpy or an energy release, okay, so a negative value here. However, um, if this value is, you know, going to be really, really large and positive, um, the overall delta H value that we get for our delta H of solution is going to be positive. And if that value is large and positive, the solution is unlikely to form. Now, that's not to say that a positive delta H of solution means that, you know, a solution uh, of that type will not form. Um, so what really matters is both sign, which a positive value, um, and the magnitude. So the larger the del positive delta H of the solution, the less likely um, the solution itself will form.